All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is um, the Pro Step Bass class. What we're going to do is I'm going to start going over the classes <clears throat> on here on the computer and try to upload this as a video that everybody can go through and have the class basically at their home that they missed if they weren't able to attend at the restaurant the night of. And um, I hope that I can help the people that view this as much as I did the people in person. Uh, if you go through this and have some questions based on what I show you, please feel free to message me um, and I'll get to them as best as I can. But I hope this will be pretty explanatory without making you sit here for hours on end. But without further ado, we're going to get this one started. This was our first class we had, and it was uh, choosing a rod, reel, and line setup that works for you. And that's really important to each and every angler based on what their strengths are, what their favorite ways to fish are, their baits, and things like that. So I hope I cover everything in here that helps you, um, you know, put together a setup that works for however you need it to work for you. So let's get started. <clears throat> When I worked at Bass Pro Shops, one of the biggest things I saw people do as far as customers that I thought was backwards is they shop for everything in reverse order of importance. Um, the first thing they would do is they would shop for a reel. Um, they'd come to the reel counter, they'd get excited about a new reel that was out, and the first thing I would ask them is, what are you going to do with it? And they'd look at me funny, and you know, I'm wanting to get in their head about specifics about <clears throat> what they're going to be doing with that reel, which will tell me which one they need um, for a specific technique or line size or what have you. And then they'll go want me to put line on it for them. And then they'll want to put a rod with it. And then they'll talk about what they're going to use it for. That's the exact opposite way you want to do this stuff, guys. So the first thing you need to think about when you're setting up a combo is the technique you're going to be using it for, or multiple techniques for that matter. But that's the most important thing. And then you need to go find a rod that will load up and fish the baits and the techniques you want it to the most efficient way, in whatever manner that is. Find the line that you need for that specific technique or those couple techniques. And then get a reel that will do the job for you. The reel is the absolute last thing that you buy. I know that feels backwards, but it's the truth. And we're going to go through why real quick in a sec. So talking about the rod, it has five uses and they're pretty obvious, but when you break them down individually, it becomes pretty blatant how important picking the right rod is for when you're going to go fishing. Um, obviously, <clears throat> it's number one thing is to throw the, the lure or the rig or whatever you're using efficiently. Uh, and that's a big deal. You can overload a rod, you can underload a rod. Rods are too stiff, rods are too flimsy, whatever, but if there's a point in how you deliver the bait that makes a rod important. Also, the next bullet there is working and retrieving the lure. Sometimes you do this with just the reel, and sometimes you do it with the rod. A lot of times with bottom bouncing baits, the reel is just there to take up slack and then help fight the fish later. Most of the work is done with the rod. Other things like a crankbait are done mostly with the reel, but the rod is important in how it lets the bait work. The third bullet is the hook set. Based on what technique you're using, whether it's open hook, whether it's weedless, whether it's treble hooks, whether it's top water, doesn't matter. The rod is key into what kind of hook set you're going to use for that technique. The fourth bullet's fighting the fish. How does it behave with the fish at the boat? How does it behave with the fish that's running under a dock? Um, is it too, too weak to pull a fish out of cover? Is it too stiff to fight a fish right at the boat with treble hooks? All different things you have to think about and then helping you land the fish. A real flimsy rod is not going to help you land a fish. You're going to have to really be cognizant of that um, when you get it to the boat. You're going to have to be a little more hands-on with it, whereas a real stiff rod when you're flipping a jig or something like that, you, you got a lot of power in that rod for pulling the fish into the boat or, or up to your hand. So just a lot of different things to think about when you're classifying what a rod does for you. So the first bullet, loading or casting or delivering the bait. So you need to think about your lure weight. Like I said, you don't want to overload or underload the rod based on what your lure weight is and how you're going to be delivering it. Um, if, if you have too light of a lure on a stiff rod, you're not going to get any casting distance. And if you're throwing a bait cast reel, you're going to backlash a lot. If you have too heavy of a rod, like let's say a big swim bait or a big spinner bait on a light medium to medium light rod, it's going to overload it and you're still not going to get your casting accuracy or your distance. So don't 
overload or underload your rod. Get a get a technique for a rod you already have, or go get a rod that's built around a technique you're wanting to try that loads appropriately. And you want, you know, that first third of the rod to load up well on a back cast. And that'll tell you if it's ready for that weight of the bait. The accuracy versus distance thing is huge. So if you're going to be throwing around tight cover, putting it in pinpoint areas, you don't want a big old 7-Eleven rod. You're not going to get the accuracy with it. It's going to be really difficult to skip or to roll cast with that rod. That rod's meant for long distance throwing, a swim bait, a big spoon, a Carolina rig, things like that. Um, a shorter rod is going to give you a lot more freedom with your wrist and a lot more control and, and that's what I want for my top waters, for my spinner bait, things like that where I'm gonna be real accurate with my presentations and where they land. So just think about that when you're trying to figure out how long your rod should be. 6.6 um, six is a great place to start and you can go up or down from that based on whether you need accuracy or you need distance. Pitching is a special example where a longer rod can help if you're gonna make quiet little accurate pitches to, to lily pads or to grass or to docks or to rocks or anything like that. If you're gonna be pitching a bait, a longer rod will help you move that bait faster in an underhand method. It's a different type of casting altogether. Um, and when you really get on key with it and you get a long rod that behaves well with your thumb on the reel, it's easy to learn what a 3 8 ounce jig will do uh, if that's what you're fishing all day or a half ounce jig or something like that, once you get the rod dialed in, and it could take a while, it could take 30 minutes to an hour, but once you get that pitch dialed in, it's easy to keep going with that longer rod than a shorter rod. Skipping is different. It's a precision way of presenting a bait under docks, under tree limbs, whatever, but you need a lot more forgiveness in the rod tip because it lets it load up and get that spring action that lets that bait skip under the dock a lot easier. So with skipping, you want a little more tip to your rod, a little more soft tip. Maybe about the first third needs to be a little more flimsy to let that bait really spring under the dock and skip across the surface. So two specific little casting types that are different from just your overhand, your roll cast, whatever, that require a little bit more specific rod choice. So working or retrieving your bait, um, when you have a constant retrieve bait for the first bullet, like a crankbait, like a spinner bait, even something like a whopper plopper, your rod positioning um, will kind of help you choose what rod you want. So with a crankbait, you're typically going to have your rod down. Well, in that particular case, the fish is going to load up under the water. So you won't really have to set the hook much. So you need the rod to set the hook for you, which is why most people when they're crankbait fishing have it, you know, nothing heavier than a medium action rod. Unless you're using a really, really big crankbait, usually a medium action with those open treble hooks lets the fish suck the bait in and doesn't pull those open trebles out during the fight. So, but if you're, you know, throwing a big whopper plopper, most of the time your rod's gonna be up a little bit. So the fish is gonna pull it down. So that's kind of key. You want a little bit stronger rod to throw that heavy a bait, but you want, you don't have any, any much line in the water to pull against the rod tip. So you keep your rod a little bit higher. You want a little bit stiffer so you can take up that slack quick when the fish hits it. So just think about that when you're doing constant retrieve baits. Most of them are with open hooks. If you're gonna do it with a closed hook, like a Texas rig swim bait or something like that, like a weedless jig, you're gonna want a little bit stiffer rod as well to pound that hook home. So with treble hooks, a little bit softer rod. With single hooks, maybe a little bit stiffer rod to pound the hook home. Just a little key to use there. So when you're twitching, walking, or popping a top water, it's the same thing. So if it's an open hook bait, you want a little bit softer rod to let the fish eat it. And I like a shorter rod for twitching and walking and popping because I have more control with my wrist over the bait. When you walk the dog, you usually don't use your whole elbow and, and arm and hand. You usually just use your wrist. A shorter rod is easier to do that with. I wouldn't go any higher than a 6.6 as far as rod length. Um, with a weedless bait, it can be a little different, but still you're trying to twitch that rod with your wrist, a shorter rod helps. With a weedless bait, again, you're gonna probably want a little bit stiffer rod tip so you can set the hook home. Different with an open hook, you want a little bit softer rod tip. So just keep that in mind. I think the twitching, walking, popping topic here is gonna be based on rod length. Try to keep it 6.6 or below so you have maximum control with your wrist. 
With bottom bouncers, it will vary. With bottom bouncers, usually your rod is up and vertical, and you, you want a little bit of tip enough to feel that bait um, as it moves across the bottom, so you can feel the light bites, you can feel when you come into a brush pile, you can feel when you come into a rock pile. But this is going to be strictly based on how heavy your bait is. So if you're going to be using like a little eight ounce shaky head, you want a rod soft enough that's not going to lose contact with the bait. Versus if you're using a half ounce jig, flipping it into trees, you're going to need a heavier rod to hammer that hook home and typically catch a bigger fish with a bigger jig. So the bottom bouncers, the rod you choose will, will vary greatly on the weight of the bait and how soft or how heavy you need to feel that, that bait as it comes across the bottom. When you're dragging a rig, like a Carolina rig, like a wobble head, like a deep diving crank, you want a longer rod that moves a lot of line when you sweep the rod across your body. Trying to fish a Carolina rig on a six foot rod is so difficult. I've tried it before, I don't like it. I don't even really like a 6.6. If I'm going to throw a Carolina rig or anything <clears throat> that I'm going to drag as my presentation, I want a 7-foot rod or longer. This can be difficult in a kayak, but it's doable. If you don't really like that, step down to a 6.8 or a 6.6. I just warn you, you're not going to move as much line when you're, when you're dragging the bait with that shorter rod as you would a 7-foot rod. Also, when you set the hook sideways, because most of the time when you're in your drag and you feel a bite, you don't shift your position vertically with your rod. You're going to keep it flat. You're not going to have as long of a hook set with a shorter rod as you do a longer rod. So in general, dragging horizontal baits that require some type of hook set, you probably want a longer rod with a little bit of tip, but a good backbone. A deep diving crank is different. Again, open treble hooks. You're going to want a softer rod, but longer still to move that water. So just make sure with any of your crankbaits with open hooks, you have a little bit softer rod and set your drag a little bit loose just so that fish has a chance to get those, those treble hooks in his mouth. When you're vertical jigging, <clears throat> like with a spoon, like a lot of us do in the winter, or a rattle trap, and then a drop shot. So two completely different styles of vertical fishing. A spoon, you want enough backbone to snap that bait straight up. Most of your strikes on a spoon are going to come on the fall after you've snapped it up. It's a reaction strike. The fish can't handle it. They have to feed on it after they see something flee away and then get hurt and fall. It's just kind of a triggering mechanism. So with a spoon, you need a little bit stiffer rod, a medium to a medium heavy, something like that. And as long as you're comfortable you know, with how long the rod is, it could be a six foot rod, it could be a seven foot rod, whatever you're most comfortable with snapping straight up and following back down, that's fine. But make sure it's got a little bit of backbone to it so you get that power that your wrist puts into that bait to show them that erratic action. With a drop shot, completely different. You're finessing a worm or a shad or whatever you're using in the fish's face and sometimes the bites can be really, really light. And most of the time you're using a smaller hook. Some guys will use a little bit bigger hook, a two aught, a three aught, something like that, if it's weedless. Most of the time when you're drop shot fishing, you're gonna be using an open hook, either a straight shank hook that's threaded into the bait or some type of little mosquito octopus style hook that's a nose hooked or wacky rigged on a worm. So you have an open hook, a small hook, and typically some lighter line. So with that particular method with the drop shot, you know, you're gonna want a little bit softer rod. So just keep that stuff in mind based on the hook based on the line, based on the, the actual technique that you're fishing will you know greatly you know guide you in picking a rod. Your hook set, open hook versus weedless um, or buried. And we've talked about this at length already, but anytime that you're having to set the hook with a bait that has an open hook, like a spinner bait or a crank bait or something like that, you really don't have to do anything but let the rod load into the fish. And this is where you need to be really cognizant of your drag and of your rod tip and then how you actually put the hook into the fish. So with a crankbait, you normally don't wind up slack and set the hook when you feel a bite. Typically when you're moving that bait along and the fish hits, he's already hooked. Your rod has had a chance to flex and pull the hook into that fish's mouth because you're not sitting there waiting for a bite you know, before you set the hook. You're constantly whining and you can't stop yourself once that fish hits. So once that fish hits, you're already still whining and you've probably already loaded into the fish. <clears throat> it's the flex of the rod that helps let that fish swallow the bait in and get those treble hooks in without them getting thrown because they can pop out really easy on the fight. 
So your hook set with an open hook bait should just be a pull load and a constant whine until you get that fish buttoned and then you can fight the fish like you need to. Just the opposite with a weedless or buried hook, especially something like a frog, it's, it's going to take a stronger hook set like a big jig, a weedless creature bait, something like that. Just think about how hard you need to set the hook to get the bait the, the hook through the plastic and into the fish's mouth. Or in the case of a frog, those two big old thick gauge frog hooks take a lot of power to pound home just so he doesn't throw it on the jump. So think about that when you're fishing your bait. The thinner wire the hook, the more needle-like it is on the point and the less of a hook set it needs. So big old thick strong hooks usually need a good strong hook set and real thin needle-like hooks no matter if they're already in a worm buried Texas style or if they're in a drop shot or something like that. Typically need a little bit softer hook set to penetrate so they don't stretch out. So keep a lot of that in mind on your hook set with your rods. And the constant retrieve versus work for the bite, you know, if you're constant retrieving, again, same thing. You're just going to load into the fish typically, let the rod do the work, let the line do the work, let the drag of the reel do the work versus working for the bite. Like if you're flipping a little shaky head or a Ned rig or anything like that, your hook set's typically a little more strong and hard and quick because you, like again, you're trying to drive that single hook into the fish's mouth from a vertical standpoint. So... You know, just your rod needs to be able to handle that pressure, but it also needs to be soft enough to feel the bite. With a constant retrieve bait, the rod is already doing the work as soon as the fish hits. So basically, your rod needs to load up cleanly and not be real stiff on a constant retrieve versus the work for the bite type of baits. You probably want a little bit stiffer rod to hammer your hook set home and get the hook in the fish. On top water, it can be either way. With top water open hook baits, you want it to suck the bait in. With a frog, is a special case because, you know, typically you're fishing in some junk and you're trying to get him out and, he, and your hook sets faster than his mouth. So while you do want to wait, you know, just a split second once the fish hits the frog, you want to hammer it home to get those big old hooks in her mouth and get her away from the cover. But with a spook or a pop or something like that, you want to just load into the fish again. So a softer rod tip. Let the fish take the bait down, get the treble hooks in her mouth, and not take it away from her with a stiff rod and a hook set with heavy line. Carolina rig, same kind of deal. You're going to set the hook sideways because you know you, you don't want to shift your angle from sideways to vertical when you set the hook. A long rod with a slightly parabolic tip that will actually load into the fish well, but a good backbone to pull that hook into the fish. Can't stress enough on a Carolina rig, try to go a little longer. It'll really, really help your control. It'll help your hook set to pull that line into the fish quicker. And it, it'll typically keep them buttoned better once you set the hook with a longer rod because you've moved a lot more line into that fish when you set the hook hard. So Carolina rig is probably one of the only places I would recommend going longer than comfortable than your normal rods just for that particular setup. So fighting the fish, uh, the rod's important there, of course, with how it behaves during the fight. If you're in the junk when you're flipping, pitching heavy cover, it needs to be stiffer so you have more power to get them away from the cover. You're typically only using single hook baits that you've punched into their mouth already with a strong hook set, so you don't want a weak rod already for that, especially when you're pulling the fish out of vegetation. You want more control. So a stiffer rod, heavier rod is going to give you that control so you can do that. Treble hooks versus single hook, same kind of thing we've been talking about the whole time. They will throw treble hooks quick at the boat. You're, you're giving them more control. They have a whole lot more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, irregularity right at the boat. You don't know if they're going to dive or jump. Um, you can't really tell. You don't have as much leeway before they do what they're going to do. So treble hooks, soft rod. You need to let the rod do the work. Let it take all the pressure off the line and off the reel and off the bait's hooks so they're not able to throw it. Single hook, once you get it pegged, you got a good, good chance of catching that fish. All the pressure is pulled into that one point of that hook during the fight. The main thing is do not give them slack, and we'll talk about that in a second. So a heavy-weighted bait has leverage on it away from its hook versus a light bait has no leverage. So think about a heavy spoon, like a heavy jigging spoon, half ounce, three quarter ounce jigging spoon. 
when that fish comes up and shakes its head, it has a lot of leverage with that lure, that the weight of that bait shaking back and forth to help pull that hook out of the fish's mouth. Whereas a bait with little to no leverage, like a weightless fluke, when you hit that fish with that fluke, you know, the hook's in their mouth and the fluke runs up the line and that fish is trying to fight off a single hook with no weight. Terrible, terrible job for them. They can't throw it. There's no leverage. Once it gets buttoned, it's in there. But with a spoon or something heavy like a spinner bait or something like that, they got a lot of leverage they can shake and try to loosen that hole where the hook is and throw it. Spoonfish are the absolute worst right at the boat. They're going to jump and shake their head, and that heavy little spoon is going to try to fly out into your face every time. So be especially careful with how you play the fish and let the fish do what it wants at the boat with the rod and give it a lot of leeway versus when you've got them pegged with a single hook, pull them on in, just don't break your line, don't horse the fish too much, but there's a lot less uh, control and carefulness you have to have with your rod at the boat. And again, keeping the rod under a controlled load. You don't want to double the rod over the whole time because eventually the line's going to break, something's got to give, but you also don't want to throw slack to the fish. You want your rod loaded up the entire time, whether it's vertical, sideways, whatever. When you get the fish close to the boat, you want that rod under a controlled load so it has the ability to keep pressure on that fish the entire fight and you have the ability to know how to react. If you throw them slack, they're going to have all that freedom to go do what they want. And typically, they're going to jump and throw that hook. So keep it under a load, either a heavy rod or a light rod. It's easier to keep it under a load with a light rod, but then the fish at the boat is going to have a lot of power. If you hit one, two, three, four pounds and up, they're going to pull your pants down and whoop you because they're going to pull that rod over double and you lose control when that happens. So kind of find a middle of the ground there and know your rod's behavior while you're fighting the fish. <clears throat> the last thing about rods is landing the fish. So if you're on a boat and you're going to flip them into the boat, think about your hook that you're using, the hook set, and the line. If you're doing it with a crankbait, I would not boat flip those fish. I, it, to me personally, it's not worth it. The hooks could pull out really easy. Uh, the pressure is not centered on one point. Um, it's, it's a bad idea. Uh, Again, the hook set as well is a lot softer with a crankbait, with, with open hook baits like a pop R and things like that. Take your time and land the fish, especially if it's a big one. And, and your line has to be strong enough for a boat flip as well. The pressure's got to come somewhere. If you're trying to boat flip a three pounder with 10 pound line, odds are it could break. It's going to stretch to a point and it could break. So with boat flipping, just be real careful that your equipment is set up for the weight of the fish and your hook set to even be able to do that. And you know, with, when you're gonna boat flip, you can't use anything but a heavier rod, medium, heavy, and up, if you're gonna try to boat flip the fish in and not put your hand down there. But yeah, sliding the fish to your hand or net, you wanna leave a little bit of line out so you have you know control to move that fish around and the rod's not right down at her mouth. We all kind of know this, but we don't think about it. We just do it you know, naturally and innately but you don't want to wind too far down so your rod's vertical trying to pull this fish up to your hand. So make sure you leave like three or four feet of line out and then hold the rod high, swoop the fish towards you and either slide him in the net or get your hand under him. A longer rod will help this. A short rod will be a little bit more difficult. You may have to have a lot more close encounter with the fish to do this, but just make sure you keep in mind to keep that rod loaded the whole time before you even think about letting slack in it. Get that fish in your hand or in the net. Keep that rod loaded the whole time. Okay, so we're going to go over line right now. So three main types of line. Old school monofilament. We've all used it, been using it for 30, 40 years. Fluorocarbon, which came out, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And then your braided line, which came out a little bit after that. So we're going to go over each one. Monofilament has lots of stretch until you get to the really heavy, you know, Berkeley big game style lines, catfish lines. I'll talk about 
uh, of 20 pound test and more. It does have a lot of stretch. It also floats on the surface because it's pretty buoyant. It doesn't have any kind of density that lets it sink in water very well. And in that case, it's gonna drag through the column. So the higher the test, the more buoyant it is. A crankbait on 10 pound line will go six feet down. You put that same crankbait on 12 or 14, it may only go three or four because it's having to drag that line through the water column while that line is not wanting to sink. So, Keep that in mind when you're fooling with monofilament that it doesn't sink very well and it drags through the column pretty thickly. And it will develop some memory, especially on spinning reels. Um, it's not very abrasion resistant and it's decently visible underwater. So if you really are worried about using your monofilament and it getting seen a lot, go with that um, hunter green option, that low vis green that Strand puts out or trialing puts out. Um, it'll help with visibility a little bit, but it's not gonna help with anything else. Um, it is the cheapest and most widely available type of line. There's thousands of companies that make it, and it can do it all. It can do all the techniques you want it to do if absolutely necessary. Back in the day, that's all they had, and everything they fished was on monofilament. And they just, you know, basically use different pound strengths for whatever they were fishing and developed rods and techniques around that because they didn't have any other options. With fluorocarbon came along, it helped with a bunch of different styles of fishing. Uh, it didn't reinvent the wheel, it just helped with some certain techniques. It has lower stretch than monofilament, so you get a little bit stronger hook set and a little bit more reactive um, action out of the baits based on what your rod tip and your reel do. It does sink, it's pretty dense and it'll fall through the column pretty well and it'll cut through it pretty well as well because of the, the denseness and the slickness of it. It's slightly more abrasion resistant than mono. Um, it's, it's coated in a way that's, that's not nickable. It's, it's, it's in pretty good shape as far as, you know, going over wood and docks and things like that. Just, you know, real sharp rocks, you're still gonna give it trouble, but most of the time it can slide over wood and docks and, and be just fine. Uh, it's virtually invisible in water as well, which is why a lot of people use it in clear water situations. You know, step down to eight or six pound fluorocarbon and you can really hardly, if any, see it at all. It has the same refraction rate as water, so it's pretty invisible. Um, and if that's important to you, it may be something to think about. However, it has extremely high memory, especially when it gets really cold and really hot. So try to keep your reels in ambient temperature throughout the year. If you're gonna be using fluorocarbon, it'll help you a lot. And you probably wanna change it depending on how much you fish every six to eight months, if you can. It will develop memory. It will look like curly cues going through the water. It'll get on your nerves. It has a lot of twist value in it, but it has its peaks. It is more expensive, but it's pretty readily available and it can be utilized for pretty much everything you do, but it's not very good with top water because of its sink in the water. It's sag in the water will make the top water walking baits uh, and you know top water flukes and things like that and floating worms fall a little bit lower in the column. So just keep that in mind. With your braid and your super line, zero stretch. So if you're standing out in the parking lot and you put a frog in the grass and you walk back into the restaurant and you twitch your rod tip one time, that frog is going to move that much. There's no stretch to your, to your line at all. Everything responds immediately to your rod tip and your reel, which is great when you're walking baits and you're being real meticulous about how you move a bait. But, um, you know, it has zero stretch. So when you hit a fish, your drag and your rod tip need to be on point, you know, because <laughs> something's going to give and you have to be ready for that. It does float on the water and it's extremely affected by the wind from the rod tip to the water surface. The wind catches it, it's very light and cottony and uh, fabricy, so it gets caught in the wind really easily and it does drag through the water pretty heavy because of this. It's basically a fabric and it comes through the water and just swells a little bit and it doesn't cut it at all. It can be cut by sharp rocks or metal or something like that, but otherwise it is absolutely the strongest type of line you can use if that's important to you. A lot of guys use braid in the junk flipping and frogging because of its strength and its ability to cut through vegetation pretty well. Um, but other than that, if you're fishing a lot of sharp rocks and stuff like that, 
it's still going to have a chance to get nicked and, and cut and things like that. So it can be very expensive. Some braid is 30 to $40 a spool. It's pretty readily available and there's a few multiple colors. If you're going to use um, a fluorocarbon or monofilament leader, you can get away with the yellows and oranges because you'll be able to see that bait move a lot more uh, based on your rod and your line behavior um, because that line is so responsive. So it'll detect light baits. The problem is most people don't use a very long leader. So we all usually go with the black or the greens um, just to kind of cut down on that, you know, unnatural color that you can be using. But saltwater guys use a lot of yellow and orange because the fish down there don't seem to care at all. And it has zero memory which is why it's great for spinning rods. Most of my spinning setups have braid on them now from 10 all the way up to 30 pound braid. Um, there is a braided line that will do just about anything you want on a spinning rod if you can change your methods. If you can get a soft rod tip that's okay with zero stretch and a slick drag on the reel, you won't have the issue of the zero stretch um, you know, problem at all if you just behave around it with your rod and your drag and your hook set for that matter. But a lot of people like it for spinning combos because it has zero memory, which is a good deal in the wind and in the cold when you have, you know, spinning reels putting curly cues all in your line. So the reel, the last thing you buy, not the first. Spinning versus casting, huge difference. A spinning reel, um, you know, is, is mainly used for lighter baits and a bait cache is used for heavier baits. We're going to go over that in a second. Um, the size of the reel and the line capacity are crucial uh, based on your technique, um, based on how heavy a line you want to use, and whether it's monofilament, fluorocarbon, or braid. They all have different diameters for their poundage of strength, and you need to know that going into the, going into the game. The bearings are nice, but they're not the end all be all. There can be 20 bearings in a reel and it still won't behave like you want it to. Um, I would say, you know, ask some people about a reel that are actually fishing them and not just selling them and see what they think. Or if you know you've got a company you're, you're confident in the way they build reels and you've had good success with them before, just, you know, keep giving them a try. Um, but yeah, talk to your buddies and see, you know, what reels are doing well for them and what they like and dislike about them and then go from there. Um, the gear ratio is important in situations, something like a buzz bait and a crank bait. So a buzz bait, you don't want a slow, slow reel because you'll never get the bait to the surface without breaking your wrist. Um, so in that aspect, you know, I would look at something like a six, two to one and up. Whereas with a crankbait, I want a slower gear ratio so I'm not having to really slow my reel down to keep that bait at a steady pace. I can just wind like normal and be at a comfortable slow pace so that bait is allowed to deflect. If you burn a crankbait too fast over the bottom, a lot of times it can't deflect and it'll start rolling and that's when you get hung up. So on a crankbait that you're actually grinding into the cover, you want it to be a slow, moderate retrieve and let that bill do its work what it was designed to do. So something like a 5.2 to a 5.7, maybe even a 6.0 would be fine. But the gear ratio is important in different situations, and in others it's not. Like worm fishing, jig fishing, stuff like that, it's not nearly as important. Spinning reels. So, like I said, typically used for lighter techniques um, because they can throw light line. And this is why, the next step is why. The next bullet, line flying off a stationary spool. So with a bait cast reel, is different. It's pulling a spool. The spool has to rotate. With a spinning reel, the line is flying off of a stationary spool.